Just the three of us today? We can make it if we try. Just the three of us. <laughs> you and I. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular.com slash forum and sign up today. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 10 of the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel we have Aaron Frost. Hello. Joe Eames. Hey there. Lucas Rubelke. Yo. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv and this week we are going to be talking about our preferred backends for... Angular. You know, when you introduced the show, it kind of sounded like Avengers in Angular. That's right. We are the Avengers. I get to be the Hulk. <laughs> Come on, man. Is that because you're really big or because you don't have any social skills? Oh. <laughs> Monosyllabic answers. Awesome. Puny. Good. I am so leaving. All right, so uh, I'm curious, what backends have you built Angular stuff against? I've used Angular with Express and Node, and I've done some with Happy in Node. I've also used some Firebase as well. And you've used Java. Uh, so at work, I use Java. Yeah, I, I didn't write that myself, though. So yeah. I was excluding it. But I have used it with Java as well, yeah. Yeah, Java's a hard one to claim because it, it could have been in Fox Pro back end for all that we had to deal with it over at Domo. Yeah. It was just a set of services that we called. Yeah, it's just a bunch of buckets that we talked to, so... So I can so, add in there uh, .NET as well. And I think I've done pretty much almost every back end. I'm doing .NET right now. I've done Rails. Known demand? Almost. Almost known demand. So let's see. Uh, Rails, .NET... I've done Java, I've done Python, and also uh, Mongo. So I've actually been playing around with Strong Loops API or libraries, which is really good. And then I, I use Firebase quite a bit as well. The beauty PHP? of it is, yes, PHP as well. If you delineate kind of your back end and your front end on a REST API, is really what's on the other side of the fence is kind of trivial. So I've used quite a, a few versions of, of back ends. So. How about a, a custom C++ built web server? Well, now you're just getting crazy. What about Erlang, bro? What about Erlang? That is, uh, we should issue a challenge to our audience to, to produce a REST API in Erlang, and I will implement it. True story. Nice. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. I, I happen to know Lucas's some Erlang folks. Lucas's $10,000 Erlang challenge. Yep, bring it on. I am connected to Erlang people, so I... I might just do that to you. I mean, for you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. How kind. So I've done Ruby on Rails. I've also done... I've played with the mean stack, and I've done a little bit with Sinatra. And uh, Sinatra is another Ruby framework. What's your everybody's favorite? My favorite's mean. I haven't done enough mean to say it's my favorite. I'm probably still happily in the Rails camp. I haven't Sorry. done enough Mongo to be like in, in love with it. I would do mean, but more like with my sequel. My sequel? <laughs> yeah, what's up? Can I not say that? Is that not... This is not a safe place? <laughs> <laughs> this is a circle of trust, Aaron. Yeah, judgment I didn't say, yeah, I didn't say MSSQL, man. I said my sequel. I thought it was okay. Yeah, it's all good. I do... I really like Rails and uh, the main stack, but if I'm just kicking something else, a lot of prototype work, I actually use Firebase because you get the real-time stuff, but you can also translate that into a REST API for free. So I uh, generally I'll, I'll start with Firebase and then I'll move over to usually like the main stack if I need to. So every time you guys build something on a Rails backend, do you get a nasty letter from DHH saying stop it? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. That you're wasting your time using Angular because server side HTML rendering is all you need. Stretching, you're yeah. stretching, Joe. That's exactly what he said, dude. That's exactly <laughs> what he said. But with the accent. I uh, can't do the accent. Well, life <laughs> goes a little beyond DHH's opinions. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's it, it seems to work really well. I'm curious, in Rails, what do you use to build your JSON out? Generally, the way that I understand it, I am by no means a Rails expert, but that you generate your routes, and then just by tacking the, uh, the .json 
onto to the routes, I, I get that for free. So that has been my experience is that somebody would generally, I'm going to work with like a real developer and build out the models, uh, generate the routes, and then um, we get the kind of the JSON stuff for free. So, okay. You're using JBuilder, which is the default in Rails. Yeah. So, and uh, it's easy, and that's why I love it. Nothing wrong with that. Yes, sir. You guys mentioned Firebase and that you like it when you're prototyping and stuff, but what about for a more serious implementation? When does Firebase, how does Firebase work for something that isn't just a prototype? I know that we are going to have a Firebase episode sometime in the future, but it's time for some real talk. Is I love <laughs> Firebase. I think it is amazing technology, but I am a firm believer in using the right tool for the right job. And so Firebase is really good, in my opinion, for doing real-time stuff. So, for instance, if you have an application and you need to actually integrate kind of real-time uh, functionality into that, that it's, it's great for that, as well as for prototyping. It's really excellent to, to get a prototype up. Where it kind of starts to fall apart is if you have kind of complex relationships within your data models that you need to, to represent and expose via backend is that like there's no ability to kind of query the database or you know query your backend and get like filtered results. Or if you need to actually establish a relationship, you kind of have to denormalize your structure to do that, which is fine for kind of small things, but it it becomes very difficult uh, very quickly. And so for that reason, I think it's it's understanding that limitation of, you know, if you need to perform queries against like a back end, not the case, or not an appropriate use case. So that would be kind of one thing is what are the actual requirements for that where it does at the same time as it works very well in conjunction with other back ends. So using even Firebase as an event bus that works with like a Rails application, I've done that to where we stored the data because it was sensitive, like HIPAA-compliant data, into Rails. And then once it was updated, then we let Firebase know. And then from there, we were able to update like certain pieces of the application. So really, for real-time stuff and prototyping, but if you need to do uh, complex data models, I would probably put that onto like Mongo or like Postgres and then expose just the pieces you need via Firebase, if that makes sense. Would you pair them up together then? Yes, and so I've done that with Mongo and Elasticsearch and Firebase, kind of using those three together. So Mongo to hold like the main uh, kind of data model, and then it, doing rich querying via Elasticsearch, which was really, it's really great tech there, and then doing the real-time stuff and synchronizing that via Firebase. And so that is worked really well. It was pretty easy to set up and coordinate those. And um, I, I think it's a really good setup there. It's using Firebase in conjunction with something else. But even like Mongo, is if you want to do really kind of so fast, rich querying, I don't think that is maybe like the appropriate technology. It's probably Mongo plus Elasticsearch is what I've had the best luck with. Hmm. Does anybody use Kinvey? Ryan Doan gave an awesome talk at the Utah JS conference about backend as a service. And he mentioned Kinvey specifically and kind of really, really talked it up. He talked about Firebase. But he also talked a lot about Kinvey. Mentioned a few others. I think he mentioned Go Instant and the App Accelerator Cloud. Some ones that are more detailed towards being a mobile backend. Right, but right, he, right. Ta he talked about Kinvey and said that that was a really awesome backend as a service. You know, his whole talk was basically talking about how backend as a service is potentially going to do the same thing that platform as a service did and kind of grow to be this thing that will enable developers to build apps you know, potentially without needing much in the way, if anything at all, in back-end work and just hook up to a back-end as a service and not have to do anything. You know, where platform as a service eliminates the need for, you know, IT guys worrying about infrastructure, back-end as a service eliminates the need for back-end work. This is a pretty interesting talk. Yeah, there are several of them out there, and we've talked about them on the iFreak show, and uh, it's definitely an interesting thing to think about. I've heard that before, and I've never like fully been able to wrap my head around how it could be secure. Uh, I'm sure that like the guys at Firebase would be like, "Well, it's easy," and there's an explanation. I've just never been able to wrap my head around it. Hmm. I don't know. We'll have to remember to ask the Firebase guy that, and then heckle him when he yeah. answers. Well, I will say it is easy-ish, but we will save that for another episode. 
you all come back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lucas, be, it's easy to be safe, to be secure. It's well, so they have some rules, uh, kind of access tool in the forge that you can actually set up, like who can actually write to what or what is exposed. So there definitely is when you go to like a paid firebase is you get a very kind of specific email like, hey, you know, you really need to kind of go through these steps to kind of lock this down and make it secure. And so you can set, like, you know, access privileges and, and who can do what to, to the different nodes within your Firebase object. Huh. Okay. And so I know that it's, it's, a, it's essentially a JSON object that you kind of construct. They are working on some tools to, to make that a little bit more intuitive. So they will say, like, yeah... You know, handwriting this JSON object is not super easy. And so that's why I said easy-ish. But it's fairly well documented, but I think they're working on like kind of a UI tool to, to make it a little bit more intuitive. So moving away from uh, backend as a service, Lucas, as you're working with, you said you're working with .NET right now. How do you like that? It's interesting. So I think that with .NET, we're using, I think, MVC like 4.5, and um, we have the gentleman who's doing the .NET kind of like REST API. The beautiful thing about it is, is that because it is REST, I don't really have to worry about the implementation details on kind of the .NET side per se. And so I've, I've jumped in and, and fiddled with it, but more so it's kind of the ecosystem around like Visual Studio and, and kind of the Microsoft ecosystem that I think has been interesting, as well as having to set up my templates uh, via routes in uh, the MVC framework, but as a whole, it's been, you know, I think once you wrap your mind around, like, oh, well, this is the .NET way to do it, it's pretty streamlined. Um, the interesting thing is that I know in the new versions of Visual Studio, they're coming up with, or uh, they're going to introduce grunt support, but they have, you know, the NuGet, their kind of own build management system, and so it's really weird. I feel like I'm in the void by being in a kind of this ecosystem that doesn't actually have, like, Grunt as a first-class citizen. And so if anybody from Microsoft is listening, um, so please put that on the fast track. I love you. Thank you. Switchy <laughs> Gucci's. So, so are there trade-offs that you found between using a Node backend or a Rails backend or .NET backend or something else that, that really make a difference in what you're choosing for a specific project? Well, I think what it what the client is using ultimately is you want to get the best solution for the client. So in this case, we're using .NET because well, their entire infrastructure is built on .NET, and so you know that's obviously the right choice in this case. But I think a lot of it really honestly comes down to not necessarily the technology per se. Like, oh, are you using Python or Ruby or you know Bot or you know kind of the mean stack? Is a lot of it comes down to I think your existing skill set the ecosystem, and also kind of the, the tooling around it. So interestingly enough, I don't think it's like the language per se that would cause me to make a decision one way or the other, but you know, what's the ecosystem, the community like, and the tooling. So for me, I really love the mean stack because you kind of have this really amazing like tool chain, whether you're using Grunt or Gulp, to kind of build these things out. With Angular, you have Karma, so you have this amazing test runner that you can do different things with. And so it's kind of these tangential things that really, I think, affect my decision tree. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I said that Mean would be my favorite. I like the synergy in the tools and basically working with JavaScript the entire time. So I like that a lot about Mean. But I will say that I'm not sure if we necessarily disagree, but I'm very familiar, obviously, with .NET. And .NET seems like a very polished experience when it comes to throwing everything together, all the little tools. The problem is it's just missing tools that I like to use. For example, as you mentioned, Grunt isn't a first-class citizen. Or right. Same thing would be true with Gulp, right? So it's missing tools that I like to use, which is why I just prefer Mean a little bit better. But I'm also one of those developers that doesn't like black boxes as much. So I prefer working with tools that let me dig into them a little bit more and expose a little bit more of themselves. And .NET doesn't necessarily always do that. Sometimes it does, kind of, but I'd say in general they're more black box-ish than I like to be. So that's why I prefer more mean. But I feel like I end up building a lot more pieces with mean. Like if I was just looking at absolute time to from start to when I have something working and building, then I think .NET is kind of hands down a winner between those two over mean. And I, I totally agree. Like Visual Studio is a really good IDE once you kind of wrap your mind around how they do it. 
and kind of make peace with those black boxes. I actually learned how to do C sharp using ReSharper. Yeah. So, you know, ReSharper plus Visual Studio is a really kind of, it's a really good development experience if, like, that's all you're doing. As well as they have kind of good integration with a lot of the other Microsoft tooling. So, for instance, we're using a, you know, Team Foundation server, and it just integrates kind of seamlessly into that, right from the ID. Or if you, you know, need to touch the database, you can do it right from the ID. So it's, it's actually kind of this composition of black boxes. Mm-hmm. That, you know, if you're all in, it's great. But if you need to kind of introduce like new things, or you want to do things kind of in a different way, it's a little challenging. I agree with that. I hope that your TFS experience is better than last time I was playing with TFS. I hated it. It's not too bad. I mean, once you kind of accept it is what it is, um, it hasn't been not too painful. So, so to switch gears, actually to go to circle back around, this is surprisingly apropos, but. Next week on JavaScript Jabber, we're having the episode on backend as a service with Ryan Doe and the guy I was talking about. Oh, yay. Awesome. Just noticed that. So I'll have more questions to ask him based on this episode. Yep. And then after that, next week is Angular Fire. Oh, yes. Is so that, Is that next week? Yeah. Yep. episode? Yep. Oh, nice. Got Michael Wolf and David East on talking about Angular Fire. Oh, nice. Two awesome episodes in a row. I'm excited. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, it'll be way cool. So let's talk about PHP. I want to talk about PHP. <laughs> I have no experience whatsoever. <laughs> I right. felt like you were in the JS twat talk where he's like, all right, let's talk about languages that suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> and then <laughs> Joe's like, all right, let's talk about languages. That, let's talk about. Anyway, I love PHP. Lucas, PHP same developers, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas, talk about PHP. So PHP is, I think, proof that. You can take an okay language and do really kind of amazing things, aka, like, if I'm going to do a blog, it's going to be in WordPress. I don't have time to, to do that. What that said is, I played around with Laravel, and so it's kind of a Rails-ish a framework for PHP, which you can generate uh, REST APIs. And um, so it's it's not too bad. Again, like, I think the biggest thing that I would want to, if anybody had any questions about where I stand on, like, Angular and, like, backends, is REST API, REST API. REST API. And so if you can delineate your front and your back end on the REST API, then you can kind of focus on the front end and it doesn't really change depending on the back end. So with that said, is it's pretty easy to generate a RESTful API in Laravel. I, so I have just a little bit of experience on just kind of a side project that I did. And it's pretty good. Uh, Toots Plus has some, some pretty decent tutorials on that as well. So if I were to do it and I would kind of go with Laravel because it is kind of like Rails, so kind of that paradigm is familiar. And uh, just generate a REST API. Awesome. Yeah. So I have a, kind of a question that spans across all the backends. My experience when I was getting into mean was that authentication was the one thing that was all, always seemed to be unique amongst the backends. You get the REST API working and it's almost like you could squint your eyes a little bit and whether you had .NET on the backend or Node on the back end or Java on the back end, you kind of went through these steps of, I need another RESTful API, so I hook up the database, I hook up, I do whatever route I need to do for it, um, I might do a little bit of validation, and then I have this piece, and I'm minimizing my back end and going, all my really hard logic is on my front end, right? So between all the different back ends, they just don't seem to be that distinct once you kind of figure out how they work, and then it's almost rote, like you could pay a, your son or your daughter to just pay a high schooler to just do your routes for you. But the authentication was the piece that always like, oh, this is entirely different here than it is in this other thing. Right? I have, for doing for the first time authentication with Express and Node was entirely unique from all my other experiences de- dealing with authentication. Do you guys feel the same way? It definitely is different from back end to back end. So, like, for instance, if you're using, like, Node, uh, you have, like, Passport... Um, I know that in Rails there's a specific one that you can use. I don't remember off the top of my head, so Charles, if you want to jump in and if you know one, um, you know, Laravel has like their own kind of security thing. Uh, Firebase comes with, uh, they imp- implement with kind of some uh, authentication services, so it's kind of OAuth centric. So I would say even, you know, kind of favoring OAuth is you know, maybe a way to kind of uh, standardize across the backends so if you do that. And I know there's some pretty good libraries that allow you to kind of drop that in and do OAuth kind of across the board. 
But yeah, I was going to say, in Rails, it seems like the one that most people use is device for authentication. Right, that's it. And then, you know, there are a few others like sorcery and clearance that, you know, work pretty well. Depending, It really just depends on how much magic you want. You know, do you want to understand what it's doing, or do you want it to just do it? Um, device is kind of magical. But speaking of OAuth, that's typically the way that I go with authenticating backends to get API access. And the library I use for that in Rails is called Doorkeeper. It's actually going to be the first episode of a new video series I'm putting out called Rails Clips. So if you want to pick up some tips on how to do Ruby on Rails, JSON API backend, that's kind of going to be the first four or five episodes of this new series that I'm doing. But uh, yeah, Doorkeeper makes it really easy for you to set up applications, set up application keys, and get authenticated. It sounds like Dorky Purr rather than Doorkeeper. Yeah, what's a purr? Yeah, what's a purr? <laughs> it's like when a cat is purring, but in a really no. dorky way. Ah. Yeah, it's an offense for a cat, dude. You're hurling offenses at the cat. Yes. Right. We it's apologize what makes a ratio a ratio. Listeners. You have a real dorky purr. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But And then there are also a bunch of JSON API libraries that you can use. You don't have to go with JBuilder. And depending on what you're doing, some of them are pretty nice. So uh, Active Model Serializers allows you to deal with your JSON like a regular object, and then it just sends back the appropriate result. And Rabble is, it provides a DSL that makes it easy to, again, serialize your objects in a way that you want. And you can actually nest stuff in those, and it's a really, really nice way of turning your response into a handy little view. So Awesome. I'm really excited to talk about Angular Fire next time. Are there other backends that we haven't really discussed? That... We kind of talked about. I mean, we we mentioned Node and Express, and really anything Node based, which is a lot of what like guys on their own time are are using. Not, and I'm not saying most any of the developers are using Node and Express, but it is one that we kind of glanced over just because I think we just went, well, that's the one that a lot of people use, so we don't need to talk about it. Like, let's talk about these other ones that may seem a little more. Like, not common for Angular, but I think, I mean, I love the story with a Node and an Express or a Happy or, you know, there's now sales out there for Node. And that, that, that kind of RESTful framework on top of Node, you know, where JSON's just kind of built into the platform and, and you don't have to deal with, I don't know, odd stuff in your JSON because the platform, the your web server also speaks JSON inherently, but I don't know. I think it's a great, it's a great flux. Also, you don't really have a ton of context switching. And for, for me, I mean, I know there's some really, you know, sharp developers out there. And so when I complain about context switching, some of them like just look at me like, dude, you're stupid if that's a problem. But, and then, and maybe I am, but it is a big deal for me when I'm like writing my backend. And if I have to write it in Java, which is what I used to use, when I'd switch back and forth from the front end and the back end, I wasn't like full steam ahead when I'd switch because you got to get back into that framework. And, again, for some people, it's nothing. For me, it was significant. And switching to Node, I was like, dude, I can, like, literally switch back and forth, and I don't even miss a beat. I can just keep going. And and for me, developer productivity, it's been sweet. And then, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of using Node all the time. But, I mean, and since I use Angular, those are what I, I combine most of the time. So Using JavaScript all the time like, is what you mean. Yeah, using using Node because it allows me to write JavaScript on the front end and the back end. So. so that's a pretty interesting perspective. When I started working with Mean, I would say the very first thing that I noticed was that the context switch was actually more difficult for me. Not that I don't still, do, again, I prefer the Mean stack, right, or Node on the back end. I, again, I'm not really stuck on the Mean stack. I really like Koa. I think that's a very cool framework, and I played yeah. around with it some and thought it's awesome, love it. I find the context switch to actually be more difficult because the conventions and the way that you write JavaScript in Rails is different than the way you write JavaScript on the client side, especially, you know, obviously in Angular, right? But because it's so much different, I found myself doing things in the front. I'd go to the back end and I'd write it a certain way and I realize, oh, I, this is entirely wrong. I have to switch this. So around. I kind of agree, but then I changed the way I wrote my back end. And, like, Angular really was like, hey, Aaron, Stop doing it the way you're doing it and use promises. And so once I threw all my, my backend stuff to use Q and I got promises, 
My mm-hmm. code is all based around promises. The way my code looks is way different, and they look really similar when you're writing your your back end services and your front end services, and they all use um, uh, promises like that stuff. So I don't know. It, it looks way different when you so, write your back end using promises as well. Are you doing so, that with oh. with Express? Oh yeah, really? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see how you did that. Yeah, no, and and, and again. Like, it makes your code, it feels a lot like you're writing your front-end code because it's all promise-based, and you can do, you know, your, your promise.all, your promise.race, you can chain them, and because you're using Q, it works almost exactly like what you think the Angular's Q is going to do, and so but it is super predictable for an Angular developer to use Q in your node code as well. So Yeah, I did, I did find that figuring out, okay, I'm using these modules this way here, and these modules this way here, and it was a little bit different because I kind of expected it all to work the same way when I first started with MeanStack. I am curious, though. It seems like people get excited about MeanStack and, you know, I could share all my code between the front end and the back end. Is that a pipe dream or does that actually happen? For me, it's, I found that to be a pipe dream, but after talking with the guy on ha- at a Habit RPG mm-hmm. on Ionic, you know, he's doing a fair amount of it, uh, sharing code. Although... Isn't he sharing? He's he's sharing code between his website and his, uh, his mobile, mobile site, app. right? Yeah, that's what. So he's not saying. sharing back in front of. I didn't share a could share a single line of code and any any of the code that I've written. I've never been able to share a single line yeah. of code between server and client. And the only code that I'd want to share would be maybe some validation, but it seems like it's entirely different. I mean, yeah. I could see wanting to share like in a traditional MVC setup, you might want to share your M your models. You know, where exactly. You get, you get similar behavior on both the front and back. And validation is a good example of that. But. And that's exactly what I was going to say. It was your models is where I think you could get reuse. Because on the client, if you have you know an item and it goes inside of a item list, and you have a model called item list and a model called item, and you know they know how to talk to each other, and you know they may even have a cyclical dependency, like a cyclical reference, so that they're easy to use with each other. Using those two models across the front and the back could be a thing that you could do. I haven't done a ton of reuse, but again, I would consider myself a total noob as far as even trying to reuse code from my client and my server. I haven't even put a lot of effort into it, so Let me, is it um, possible? Probably. I, I, I've never really done it. Let me jump in here real quick, because I have actually I have some experience with isomorphic JavaScript. It is I. I did a project, and I kind of am still somewhat involved with uh, Get Human. Uh, Jeff Welpley, who is kind of their engineer on that, is Get Human is essentially kind of um, I need to get a human on the, on the phone, and so essentially it's a community driven site that relies heavily on search engine traffic. And so the problem that we had is we need to actually render the views on the server, but then share that code in the client with the Angular. So that was a real need to solve that isomorphic uh, JavaScript problem. So to, to have server-side rendering, but then be able to pick it up on the client side. And so it definitely can be done, but it's not without challenges. In fact, I think he would be a great candidate or person to have on a future um, Adventures in Angular podcast because he had to solve that problem because their entire business model depends on search engine traffic. And so you have to do things on the server, the rendering, as well as pick it up on the client once it has been rendered. And uh, so it can be done, but it's not without uh, some challenges, to say the least. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be awesome. In other words, bring it. (laughs) Bring it on. I will let him know he's in the saddle. Awesome. (laughs) All right, well, we're getting really close to the end of our time. Is there anything that we would be crazy not to talk about that we haven't yet? Probably our users know a lot. They're pretty smart. But yeah, I can't think of anything. If there's anything in particular you want to talk about, and I'd like to do shows eventually, not all in a row, but, you know, do one on MeanStack and do one on Express, do one on PHP, do one on Rails, you know, and, and kind of get some perspective so people can see an entire stack in that technology. So if there's a particular stack that you'd like us to talk about, let us know that too. You can just tweet us at, at Angular Podcast. Awesome. All right, should we do some picks? Let's do it. All right, Lucas, what are your picks? So I just have one. Uh, last week I got back from the Strange Loop Conference in St. Louis. It is probably outside of NGConf. I love you guys. It's uh, my favorite conference. And 
it's just a ton of like functional like Scala closure. Just really smart people. Uh, Stephen Wolfram was there this year. Rich Hickey has spoken pretty much every year that I've been there. And so I would just check out their uh, YouTube channel. And it is just amazing. Like those talks are ridiculous. They will make your head spin, but pretty incredible. So that is uh, my pick. Strange Loop videos, incredible. Awesome. Joe, what are your picks? My pick is a uh, talk given by Lawrence Lessig from OzCon 2002 on free culture. It's this great talk about, he focuses primarily on copyright, but talks really just about our entire culture and freedom of expression and artistic expression. It's a super awesome talk. And it's also, he was kind of a pioneer of a certain style of giving presentations as well. He's pioneered this Lessig style of presentations. So it's very interesting. Great talk. So that's going to be my pick. Very cool. Aaron, before we get to your pick, is there any news that you want to give us about NGConf? Yeah. The call for papers is out. So if you're an Angularian and you're you're wanting to be a part of the next ng-conf, go ahead and submit it. Head over to the, to the site ng-conf.org and do a submission for a chance to speak at the conference. We're not going to have a, um, unlimited spots. Obviously, it's, the lineup's going to look a lot like as, as far as the show runs, like it did last year. So we'll have a specific number of spots. All I can suggest is be outrageous. You know, it needs to be outrageous. So, if you can think of something outrageous, name. yeah, no, no, I'm not talking to you, Lucas, even though it is your name. Um, <laughs> if, if it's outrageous, it has got a better chance, is all I'm saying. So, yep. that's, that's my only tip. It's my tip of the week. Very cool. And then, what is your pick? So, my pick, I, I just gave a course at Frontend Masters on ES6. I wasn't going to pick it, but we got so much good feedback on it. I'm going to do a pick. I really think people can get a lot out of it. It's on ES6. The next version of JavaScript coming out, it's a, a full-day course, and uh, I thought it was really informational as a teacher, and, and it sounds like most people um, that were there also really liked it. So I'm going to pick Frontend Masters, the ES6 course. Cool. All right. So I have one pick. As some of you may know or may not know, I love Audible. So the latest book that I've been listening to is a fiction book. It's called Michael Vay and the Jade Dragon. It's a young adult fiction, so it's a pretty easy read, and it's just kind of a fun book, and so, yeah, I enjoyed reading that, and so that's what I'm going to pick, and I'll put links to that in the show notes. All right, well, thanks for coming. We'll catch you all next week. Working and learn from designers at Amazon and Quora, developers at SoundCloud and Heroku, and entrepreneurs like Patrick Ambron from Brand Yourself. You can level up your design, dev, and promotion skills at Level Up Con, taking place October 8th and 9th in downtown Saratoga Springs, New York. Only two hours by train from New York City, this is the perfect place to enjoy early fall at Oktoberfest while you mingle with industry pioneers in a resort town in upstate New York. Get your ticket today at levelupcon.com. Space is extremely limited for this premium conference experience. Don't delay. Check out levelupcon.com now. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.